to the cloud. Okay, we are recording. Okay, well, welcome to the June 16th, 2020 session of TeamSpeak, sorry, <laughs> version of Zoom for uh, Tangerine SDR. My name's, my name's Dave, KB0S, and this week, um, I've actually been editing papers in LaTeX, so it's kept me busy, including one of the papers is I've been working on a chapter from Tom's book. So uh, that's making some progress. Uh, I hope to have something to share with the Tapper board next week uh, to see if they think I'm doing an okay job or not. Anyway, so that's about it for me. Uh, next on the list, uh, I'm going to use the participant list that I have, and, and the next one I have is Nathaniel, W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, it's been quite a busy week for me. Uh, Rachel, Anthony, and I moved to the new QTH, as I was showing, and um, the move went very smoothly. Uh, we're quite happy, and we already have a ham radio antenna set up. So I think I owe Bill a QSO, um, a SCED. Um, let's see. Um, and then aside from that, I've been working with um, Dev and Bill Lyles on the, and we met with um, Yuha Viernan. So we actually met with Yuha on Zoom and we talked about um, ionospheric sounding, uh, passive ionosound. So maybe Dev can talk about that in a couple minutes. I've been working with Veronica and training her on how to do data analysis in Python. Um, and I'm starting to work on some more grant proposals, so that's going to keep me busy. And I have been um, working on uh, an invited presentation for the CDAR workshop about the personal space weather station. So I've been putting that together and I need to record that, make that video tomorrow, and then submit it. So it's been quite a busy week here. Uh, right. W2NAF back to me. Very good. Next on my participant list, I have Scotty, WA2DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Dave, for uh, running the show again. And uh, thanks to Mike for recording, or uh, posting the recordings, I guess. <laughs> it's a little bit different than uh, TeamSpeak, huh? So anyway, this week, uh, that didn't get much done on uh, SDR stuff because, uh, as you know, the uh, date for move out of our building is looming. So... Uh, we only have uh, about 50, now, now it's days, it's 15 days left. See, now it used to be months, then it was weeks, and now it's only days left. So it's been a big chore getting an 8,000 square foot building cleared out after the accumulation, 10 years accumulation of junk. So that's uh, got to be taken my priority because on July 6th, whatever isn't out gets gone. Somebody else gets it. So at least take the valuable stuff, right? Anyway, back to you, Dave. Well, fine business, Scotty. And next on the list, we have Dev. Go ahead, Hello. Dev. Hello. Good evening, everybody. So I had the pleasure of being invited uh, at, uh, to Nathaniel's house. And I went there. I had a very pleasant uh, evening, I think, yesterday. It was right yesterday. And uh, and we have, he, we talked to uh, Ham and it was a live conversation and I was surprised the live conversation was very lively even with a stranger. I asked him afterwards and he said like, well, did you know him? He said, no, like I just, this, that's how we know here in, in the ham community. And there was fun thing to know, okay. And <clears throat> apart from that, we have placed order for, orders for the equipments uh, that we placed. Uh, they are on, on the way, they are GPS oscill uh, discipline, uh, oscillator kit, uh, GPS antenna, magnetic mount, daughter board, uh, and USRP N200, uh, the SDR. So, and there are a few other uh, cables, etc. And all of them are on the way. And once they reach, we'll try to assemble them and build our uh, PSWS. And, We'll try to receive signals, available signals of opportunity. We're aiming to receive chop ion of Sunday, a, a oblique ion of Sunday signals, uh, which are already, already in the operation. And we discussed with Yuha, 
you have from uh, Norway, uh, how to process those signals. Like he has it in open source uh, in his GitHub. And we will take his, we are essentially starting with replicating what he has done. And later on, like if we succeed with that, we'll try to add instruments, like add more complexities to this, our initial uh, personal space weather station. But I think in a week or two, we will be able to make a start. And moreover, in New Jersey, we already have all of this assembled together, but that is functioning for a different purpose. And we are requesting Ethan Miller uh, to allow us to operate that for our goal of using it as personal space weather station of, to detect a signal of opportunity. So I think slow and steady, we are taking uh, many steps towards the direction. Very good, Deb. So next on the list, we have Tom Yarnish. Wanna, any comments quickly? Hi, well, not much. I'm a fly on the wall here. Uh, I've been following the Hamside group for a while. I do a lot of whisper work and I'm uh, looking for receiver improvements, particularly interested in the tangerine and how that unfolds. And, uh, you know, just looking for opportunities to uh, join in and be useful uh, someplace. I've, a lot of uh, antennas here in the field and always putting up more, working with uh, the Cats Ham group, Rob Robinette and others, uh, Glenn Elmore on a lot of projects. And uh, just want to stay up with what's going on. Love this group and uh, happy to be here uh, just monitoring. Very good. And next on the list, we have Bill. Uh, I, I, well, off the top of my head, I can't remember it. Go ahead, Bill. Latest thing I did was uh, participated in the ARRL VHF contest over the weekend, and uh, six meters was wide open, so it was amazing. So, worked several hundred QSOs, uh, including in a bunch of new countries in Europe, which is on six meters is amazing. But anyway, is that FT8? FT8. Is that FT8? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I used FT8 because it's just so easy and quick, but uh, uh, the sideband and CW were also open as well. So if you participated in it, but it's uh, six meters going great guns. I see it's open now. But anyway, um, <clears throat> on this project, I got the package working to where um, from the central, I have a, a very dumb simulator of the central host working where it can request files from uh, the tangerine uh, between a given start and end date time and the tangerine will get them, package them up and send them uh, while the ring buffer and tangerine and everything is running. So we got that working. Um, next thing I'm working on now is I'm wanting to uh, be able to work with some actual off-the-air data since we're running a little bit behind on the uh, the data engine. W what I'm doing now is I dug out my Pi HPSDR code, and uh, it talks to the Raspberry. It talks to not the Raspberry. It talks to the Red Pattaya, and so I'm genning that up so the Red Pattaya and this my version of HP SDR code will output data that is compatible with the design for the tangerine uh, output as long as you're running a single band and 48k samples per second. That's, that's kind of what you're limited to on the red pataya. So I'll be able to uh, simulate that and with that I'll be able to make sure that everything works with the ring buffer. I'm going to code up a thing to do a discrete Fourier transform on that and spit out files that are compatible with what the uh, the Case Western Reserve team is doing in a couple of flavors. One to pick the um, uh, the most uh, the loudest frequency in the passband, and the other one is to just spit out a, a comma separate variable uh, file of uh, um, probably 32767 bins of data. Um, uh, coming off of the, um, you know, an FFT of the data. And then, you know, you can analyze that using something as simple as Excel, just as a sanity check to make sure that 
uh, the, the signals you're seeing look like kind of what looks like the histogram coming out of HPSDR code because it does have a, a GTK output which allows you to see what the signals look like in a, in a uh, you know, if, in a visual sense. So anyway, making a good deal of progress on that. So back to net. Well, fine business. And uh, next on the list, we have Dan in for XWE. Hopefully we have your voice this time. Okay, yeah, I think it's working. Can yes. you hear me okay? Yeah, All right, great. Fine. So yeah, I think uh, last week it was either software, hardware, or the operator. I'm not sure one of those three was the, the culprit, but uh, I did reinstall Zoom and everything seemed to work correctly after the reinstall. So uh, whatever the uh, real reason was, that seemed to fix the problem. Uh, this week I did a little bit of messing around with uh, GenPy 64, which is a 64-bit um, Gen 2 operating system for the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4. And um, it seems to work pretty well. I had some issues getting the sound set up uh, with the HDMI uh, display that I have. For some reason, it didn't, it wasn't trivial doing that, but I was able to get it sorted out. Um, other than that, I worked a little bit on scripts. I have kind of an issue with scripts because the, uh, the big issue is that different operating systems have different packages and the scripts have to have a fairly well-defined package set in order to be easily transferable. And uh, it's sometimes a question of different names for the same package. It sometimes is different packages entirely. So that's been a little bit of a challenge, but uh, I've also experimented a little bit with uh, actually generating packages for specific distributions from, from source code in a script. And that seemed to work fairly well. Um, for example, on, um, on the Raspberry Pi or on Raspbian or the Raspberry Pi OS, um, you're missing, actually, you're missing libsound.io, I think, dash dev. And uh, I ended up uh, actually downloading the source code for that and, and compiling it, which is not trivial in a script, believe me. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, about it from here. Back to you, Dave. Thanks. Well, I did get those sets of scripts uh, and appreciate them. I haven't had a chance to use them on uh, Raspberry Pi, but I read them, read through them, and uh, they all made sense to me from looking at them. Well, they, they're somewhat perishable. I tried to make them as generic as I could in that uh, if you specify specific versions of software and then the version changes, it breaks the script. Right. So, you know, you have to be careful. I did run both of the ones that I sent out as recently as yesterday, and they worked okay. Okay. So at least, <laughs> at least up through yesterday, you were you were in good shape. So hopefully they'll they'll stay alive for a few more days. I'll try to keep going back and do, redoing them and uh, seeing if I can't make sure that they they're working. Okay. They aren't. I'll modify them to the point where they work. So anyway. Okay. That's it. Uh, next on the list, we have Elizabeth Hernandez. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I have no updates um, right now, so just wanted to say hi to everyone. Well, hello. Uh, next, we have, let's see. This is always interesting because the names bounce around. Um, well, Mike, uh, AAK, go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Dave. Uh, greetings to everyone on the conference call. Back to you, Dave. Good business, uh, fine business. And let's see, next we have Tom McDermott, go ahead. Good evening, and good evening to everyone in the group. Uh, let's see, last week I put out the article on the very low cost cross loop receive antenna. We discussed it uh, on the ham side call, got a lot of good questions and discussion from folks. 
Uh, it's on the mailing. I put it out to both the Tangerine and the Hamsi mailing lists uh, last Thursday morning and um, have been testing the preamp that I built for the ion spheric sounding experiments. It's very high dynamic range and very bad sensitivity. I built a version that's much better sensitivity and uh, on um, due to local AM broadcast stations, I'm getting five volts peak to peak uh, out of the amplifier from AM broadcast station. Uh, the SDR receiver can't handle that much. And um, even when I attenuate it, the preamp, the high gain preamp is overloading. So we had a long discussion about that on Thursday and I put together some thoughts on approaches uh, to do that. My situation is my three AM stations are uh, near the one near the bottom end of the band and two near the top end of the band. And so I can't put a single notch in there to take them all out. And so from that experience, uh, I kind of discussed perhaps um, uh, devising a mid-stage amplifier configuration where in between the amplifier sections, we can put 50 ohm bandstop filters or high pass or low pass filters, things like that to try and make a more flexible uh, kind of antenna. So anyway, it's out for review and I hope I'll get some good concrete suggestions and I could prototype something there. So uh, back to the group. Fine business. And let's see, next on the list, I think we have Rob, Rob in it. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry I, I showed up late because I was on the phone with the IRS. <laughs> oh geez. <laughs> Trying to get my refund. <laughs> after 90 days. Uh, anyway, uh, I really, you know, same, same thing. I'm working on my Whisper and Damon stuff and, and um, that's, that's really about it. And I don't, I don't think that's of particular relevance to this group, so. I did uh, try out some of your things and ran across a fellow, a VK that, or maybe it's VE, that was running your software and had a very nice set of graphs, and that was quite nice. Oh well, that's good. I'm, 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 I, I, I have. There, there have been um, the, the big news. Uh, there has been uh, with the release of WS uh, the uh, JTX version two dot two dot one uh, last week. Uh, they included a, a superior improved uh, decoding library for extracting spots from the um, wave files. So um, uh, there's uh, uh, some advances in the art of signal extraction, DSB processing incorporated, which is now part of the, uh, my software and of course other people, everyone who's running the new JTX gets it as well. About 5%, 6% more spots in the in a busy band, 20 meters in Europe. So, so uh, looks like there's, uh, uh, you know, there's always room for improvement, I guess, in the world of uh, radio. Oh yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for your comments. And let's see, um, Veronica. We haven't talked to Veronica yet. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, this week. Uh, Dr. Purcell has been helping me to learn how to analyze data with Python. And also, um, I've been working on, uh, Dr. Purcell is letting me borrow a computer from Scranton with more space on it. So I've been working on setting up things on that computer so I can start doing some more coding. Well, very good. It's a good language to learn. Um, next on the list, we have Victor. Go ahead, Victor. Hello, everyone. Um, I have no new updates. Um, I'm currently learning more about our ham radio, so I've just ordered a couple of books, the um, Technician Edition. So I'm um, learning from that for now. Very good. And let's see. I can't see anybody that I've missed, so I think we've gotten everybody. So we're open for general discussion. Nathaniel, did you ever get any communications from someone named um, uh, Vincent from University of North Dakota? 
You're muted. Mute. Is that Vincent Ledvina? Yes. And yeah, he, I, I know who he is. He, and, and he was asking not about hardware as much as he was asking about um, how they were going to store their pictures for the Aurorasaurus project. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, I, I was hoping that I invited him to come here and maybe talk to Bill. Uh, and I don't know how mm -hmm. he could fit in uh, his, the, their pictures maybe with different, um, um, different metadata or something on the front. He says they're looking, mm -hmm. they're looking for, I think, uh, two terabytes a year is the amount of data that they're mm -hmm. going to store. So it's a lot less than what we're doing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. let's see, it says here, no, 21 terabytes of total data per year. So I thought, well, if, if they could hook their cameras to the, to the Odroid, then couldn't they mm -hmm. just tag their data as uh, uh, Aurora vi visual pictures and uh, put it up alongside ours? I mean, wouldn't that be similar procedure? Yep, that's exactly what we want to do. Yes. Okay. Anyway, I yeah, I've actually you come here. I've actually talked to um, Liz McDonald and Liz McDonald about that idea in the past. So. Yes, it's exactly the sort of thing that I would like to be able to do. Okay, because I'm thinking that you could just plug the cameras in. He said one of the cameras is uh, a micro US, micro B USB, so that should just plug mm -hmm. right into the Raspberry Pi with an adapter. And yeah. I, they, he claims there's two cameras. They want to do a forward and backward, which is mm -hmm. why they want to do that. But anyway, um, so if they can interface the cameras directly to the SBCs, then, I mean, they could really run Bill's software, right? I mean, is it that easy yep. or am I oversimplifying it? Well, that's, that's, easy, that's what I want it to be. So that's, <laughs> that's certainly my hope. <laughs> I don't know if it's that easy, but that's, I mean, that's the dream. The dream is to be able to have like one platform that kind of coordinates all of these different instruments that, that, you know, measure, you know, different but related things. So, oh, yeah. I, 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 have, I have to put a comment in here. Scotty says, oh, okay. the, the hardware is the hard, hard part, and the rest of it's just software, which is easy. <laughs> so so I guess, put, so dump it all on Bill. Bill will take care of it, right? You, 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 should, ask, well. you should ask Bill to do things. It sounds... <laughs> It sounds like one of the the major things we're going to have to do in a, in a phase two of this project is ask NSF for a vast amount of money for storage, because mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about many terabytes per year. That that adds up pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and in cost, I mean, uh, that, that's not something we're going to be prepared for in phase one. But going down the road, I I can imagine. And another is going to be some of these. Some of these plans are going to real, really only come to fruition after everybody has uh, fiber to the desktop. Because mm -hmm. we're about uh, you know a lot of real-time imaging and stuff like that, your regular run-of-the-mill DSL upload is not going to cut it. But we'll get there over time, I'm yeah. sure. I, I, I agree with all of that. Even cable upload is pretty slow unless you get commercial. What I would like, Bill, what I would like to be able to do is, and this is the idea of being modular, is at least have the ability to be able to add extra instruments like, um, you know, like an Aurora camera or something like that. And it's very possible, you know, so we, we basically do have, you know, one cohesive ecosystem. And I, I suppose it is, you know, it may it may be too much for one piece for one Odroid to run all of these different things. But you know, someone who's trying to run all of these different things may end up, you know, getting a more substantial computer that would have the resources to handle it. So yeah, if we I can at least have the yeah. Software, yeah, if we have the software infrastructure in place, so it is essentially a personal space weather station operating system that opens the door to being able to work with people like Aurora Soros and these other other types of instruments. 
Yeah, plus there's a lot of things you can do with additional architecture too. I mean, I have a very hot uh, desktop and I, I'm able to run a virtual VMware on it. So I can mm -hmm. have all of the Windows stuff running at the same time as I'm running some of the Linux stuff at, at the same time, uh, talking to the instrumentation and lo up, uploading and downloading. And, um, you know, if, if you want to do a lot of stuff all at once, it's going to take an architecture more than what you get on a single board computer. But, you mm -hmm. know, the cost of, the cost of, this, of this kind of equipment, it's not we're going to break the bank either. I mean, for $1,500, yeah. you have a very hot desktop nowadays, very hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can do all of that at once. Yeah, and for someone who's really into this, and yeah. for... Yeah, for someone who's really interested in this, or for a you know funded research project, that's you know that's right. absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. I I want to break in here. Uh, I got two things. I wanted to update on the magnetometer. Uh, David and Holman apparently had a very successful session uh, getting Holman set up. And uh, David is continuing to put uh, upgrades to the, the GitHub for the magnetometer. So uh, they're continually being things added. Uh, Jules and Holman have asked for lots of changes and those are, are being added as they go along. And then I want to mention that uh, Dave in one HAC joined us a little late. <laughs> Just for the record. Sorry, I got distracted by six meters. Well, that's a good thing. Did Did you work the uh, Did you work the VHF contest over the weekend? I did. It was a lot it was of fun. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> it was like twenty meters. Yeah, it was ridiculous. David, what's that instrument in the background there? Oh, I've got a couple of guitars. One's a Strat copy and one's a 12-string uh, Spanish guitar. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, relating to the antenna situation, um, Dev, uh, Bill Lyles, MQ6Z, and myself have also been talking about options of what we can do to set up this I on the sound receiver in my backyard while we're waiting for, you know, our a design from the Hamside Happer group. Um, and one of the, we came up with two antennas we could buy right away. Uh, one of them is the, the passive air spy, um, U spy antenna. Is anyone familiar with that? Uh, I have one. And so, how, how does that work for you, Dave? It, it works pretty well. It's um, a compromise antenna because it uh, tunes both low, uh, lower HF and then also attempts to work on, um, it doesn't really get to uh, UHF, but it's, it goes up to 300 megahertz, I think. And there's a chunk in the middle that's cut out. Uh, but, well, it's not cut out of the antenna, but uh, the air spy equipment doesn't sense in that range. And um, I found it very good for local stuff. I'm still kind of trying to figure out um, uh, how it works for longer range stuff. The I've just had it in my room at the house here, not outside yet. And um, it it's cheap enough, it's $35, but um, I don't know. It I think it's got some, it's pretty much what Tom's doing. It, the one I have doesn't really have an amplifier. Yeah, so it's, it is a passive antenna, it does not have an amplifier. And it's also not waterproof, right? Not, no, it's not set up to be waterproof. 
Right. So but but it thinking... does a lot, lot better than a, a, a two meter whip. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is what, so which is what is I usually use with uh, RT, RTL SDRs. It is U loop HF yeah. antenna. Now, now I did um, get a small amp that's uh, using that 5109 uh, uh, IC and uh, it came from Greece and I haven't huh. put it together yet, but I was going to try that. Yeah, that'll Anybody be interesting. Else know, note you know that this that, is also usable on VHF. Yes, it is. They say it turns into a folded dipole. Yeah, so, so it's I, very nice that it has such a broad response and it's so inexpensive. I will tell you that these were back ordered for about two months uh, and it took a while to get them. I, th I think they yeah, have months had, now. Yeah, we had heard that and when Dev checked, um, they had a website that gave um, shipping gate estimates and they seem to be in stock. Now, they're somewhere in Pennsylvania is the guy selling it, which I think is in Pittsburgh area. Okay. Now this would not be a difficult antenna to duplicate. I may be wrong, but I think it uses the Mobius loop idea. Yeah, you're right about that. It, it seems to have a solid connector in the center. Well, mm -hmm. if you look at the um, info on it, it uh, that in what's in the center is crossing over. It crosses over at the top, yes. Right. So can we not duplicate that? It, it would be easy to duplicate. It's not that hard to antenna to No, wh wh what is that exactly in the center? What is it called? The, the, the connector. bottom is just a t, uh, a t and then the top is a crossover. Okay. Okay. So the, the center pin connects to the shield and the shield connects to the center pin on either side. Well, it's hard for me to imagine, you're talking about duplicating this, it's hard for me to imagine that you're going to be able to beat this price buying the parts and putting it together yourself. I mean, No, you can't. Yeah. Well, unless you it's buy, just coax. Unless you buy hundreds of them. Hundreds of parts, and then you can get it down. Yeah, we ordered two of them so far. I have one, Good. and I know uh, Dave Witten has two. Yeah. So this now this is using this is an SMA connector on the bottom. Correct. Okay. And there's but for a receive. There's about For nine... receive, we can... Sorry. Go ahead. There's about nine feet or, no, maybe more like six or seven feet of coax that comes out the bottom. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it says six feet. Two meters. Two meters, yeah. Maximum power, 250 can, um... milliwatts, so you can transmit it with it, sort of. Mm -hmm. FDA. Sort of. That would work with my Raspberry Pi Whisper. Right. I think that's what they're intending. It. Yeah, you could use the uh, Red Pattaya transceiver with it. Yes. Yeah. Or you could use a, well, you'd have to be careful, but uh, a Penelope is 500 milliwatts, so you'd have to reduce the power. Now we, if we're using this for receive, we could probably feed this using RG6, right? Yeah. I would think so. So, 
doesn't say whether it's 50 ohms or 75 ohms, but. No. In, in looking at the Good. connector for the feed line, it appears to be a different size than the other connectors. Down here. Yeah, but exactly. they, they the, one the one I have has an SMA on the bottom. The out yeah. And what the SMA connect? connector is it's RG402 coax they're using. Mm. Is that 50 or 75 ohm coax? That's a good question. I'm not clear. Fifty. It's semi rigid. Right. Yes, it is semi rigid. So that's the feed line that comes off the bottom? Or is that's that the feed line and it's uh branches. Yes. Oh, okay. And then what's at the bottom of the feed line? Another SMA? Yes. So then you could go into some other coax if you needed to put it outside somewhere. But so you probably wouldn't want to use RG6 because that's 75 ohms. Yeah. Would probably work okay, but you get a mismatch okay, right. there. On a receiver, it would be all right. You could put some sort of ballon in there. 450 watts, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what's this 250 milliwatts? <laughs> yeah. 450. <laughs> Watson would probably just arc right over that little receive transistor. <laughs> yes. I think I think you just need to change the ball and you'll be fine for higher power. Well, it's got an amplifier, mm. right? No, it does it's not, not have an amplifier. Oh, it's just passive. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what's with the 250 watts? That's that's uh, silly. Well, it's probably the ballon that they're using that limits that. Oh, that's in the bottom connector? Right. Yes. Bottom T if there. you put a, your own ballon in there, you could kick that up. Uh, with my <laughs> luck on AM, I'd probably overload that antenna. <laughs> <laughs> you could hook LEDs up to the uh, antenna port and light them up, right? Mm-hmm. I performed CX and you did the low noise ampl preamp. So they so, want you to use a preamp. So on a different subject, um, you t Nathan, you were talking about the uh, the U-Haus chirp design. Mm -hmm. And uh, how it would fit into the tangerine design. Yeah. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, that and maybe a uh, 10 gig E interface on the next generation when we get to it. So the question I have is, so, so he has two USRPs. So two mm -hmm. virtual receivers, well, two real receivers, two to the same frequency and he's got one on a horizontal or one on uh, two, uh, each of two loops that are 90 degrees out, out at right. So the cross loops. So he gets mm -hmm. uh, about 800 megabits of data out of each one of those USRPs, right? Mm -hmm. What does he feed that to? What kind of computer does he have that can handle that kind of data? Full, full, almost full board, two gigabit Ethernet ports. I, I think it's just he was just using a standard tower. I think. But so, do you have any idea what algorithm he's what he's doing with the data? Because that's, I, I presume the USRPs are simply just giving him IQ data. Yeah, I'm pretty but sure it's just IQ. I don't know the exact algorithms. I know that he's using uh, GNU Radio and um, Python and signal the processing. The algorithms are, I think, uh, I am. I would be downloading them tomorrow, uh, but I don't think I have access to data. Like he, he does not. Uh, he said like you, he would not provide it. Uh, but the algorithms are available uh, in his GitHub profile. Okay, because I'm just. Wondering whether uh, you know a, a GNU radio flowgraph is going to be able to handle that much data, and that Tom, you probably have experience with more than that, more about that than I do. So, what do you think? Yeah, it, it gets challenging um, 
it depends on the PC. Some PCs can handle close to those rates. Uh, my, uh, my question would be what the block diagram of this processor is. I have a, um, an idea that perhaps the very first block in the GNU radio processor is the D chirper uh, block, basically mixing the receive signal with a precisely timed um, chirp signal. And the result of those two is an offset frequency related to the time delay between the transmitter and the receiver. If that's the case, then what you get is a, is a tone basically, which is related to the distance. And that tone varies with the chirp frequency. And uh, if that's done that way, there's an enormous reduction in data in that very first stage. And if he's doing that, um, you know, we have options there where we could do the same thing in the FPGA. And uh, that gives the advantage then that the personal space weather station can do a phenomenal amount of data reduction uh, right up front in the FPGA. And then a whole bunch of folks can contribute um, their received measurements. So it'd be interesting to see what his block diagram looks like because it would tell us um, if there are some points within the diagram we can all agree that standardized on formats and things. Yes, we, could, we would have a, 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 we would define a format coming from the FPGA that would be this uh, de-chirped uh, mixed output, right? Right, right. And if, and if that is in the same format that UHA has, then we could, we could develop compatible data sets, which would be nice. Plus, they would be very low data rates, so we could easily upload them from folks' homes. So, so really what we have in the FPGA then, that, that first block, it would be an NCO, but it would be a uh, swept NCO synchronized with the time of the transmitter, right? Right, right. It would be a swept NCO that would be chirped at the same rate as the transmitter that you're interested in looking at, that has the same exact start time as the transmitter you're looking at. And um, I built one of those in GNU Radio in a Python block a couple of years ago using, um, using um, NumPy and uh, NumPy is incredibly efficient. If you write the Python block the correct way, um, it didn't really take very many resources at all. It ran, ran, quite, a, uh, uh, ran quite efficiently. Well, very interesting. So that would certainly be something that we could put into, we could pull into the FPGA It'll be interesting to have you dialogue with Yuha because he was yeah. definitely of the mind. Like, he even had a bullet point on his slide recommending to not do things in the FPGA because um, it limits who can modify the signal processing. Now, right. it's very, with, with that said, you know, for the purposes of the personal space weather station, if we're trying to get this out to a lot of people at a low cost, it you know may make sense to pull some of that stuff over to the um to the FPGA or to you know and basically to to talk to Yuha figure out where the right balance is on this particular project uh, because I'm, that, I mean, I'm also wondering if the um, something like the RSP duo would do this um, you know, does, if you're if he's trying to pull the processing out of the FPGA, uh, we might be able to mock it up with something that already exists, um, and then uh, you know, we can make choices of what should be in the tangerine. What wait what what do you mean by the RSP duo? The, do you know about the RSP duo, um, the RSP one A and the RSP duo from uh, STR Play? They're really inexpensive SDRs. Okay. Uh, hundred to two hundred fifty dollars. The two two channel is about two hundred fifty dollars. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I missed it. So how does that uh, um, SPDU come into play in, in this? The FPGA is essentially programming you're able to program all your math logic into hardware. And it's 
it gives you the ability to do repeated mathematical tasks extremely quickly. So it's very suited to signal processing. Um, the disadvantage to FPGAs is that it's um, a more difficult, I don't know if more difficult is the right word, it might be, but it's certainly not as common of a language to program in as say Python is. So if you're gonna make any modifications to the FPGA code, you have to have it a harder to obtain skill set. So the less the less signal processing you do on the FPGA and the more you do on the general purpose computer, the easier it is for, you know, someone like you or me or, you know, someone who does who's not an FPGA specialist to be able to make modifications to it. The downside is you have to get that data from the FPGA, which is where um, basically all the first level processing happens. You have to get that data from the FPGA onto the computer and then you need a more expensive computer. So the more processing that you do on the FPGA, the less expensive you can make the hardware because you don't need as fast of a data throughput between the FPGA and the computer and you can use a cheaper computer. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. I'm wondering what exactly he is doing with that. Um, Reading his description, he's talking about it. Um, where was it? Oh, custom GNU radio signal processing block that can be used to down convert chirps, store them into narrowband files. That's very much what we're doing with the AM Doppler project. Um, basically, yeah. uh, you know, doing FFTs to just get a very narrow band around the signal of interest. I'm wondering if he's actually scanning the uh, the center frequency to keep up with the chirp. But um, yeah, if you can get enough bandwidth to a PC, you can probably do it over there. Yeah, yeah. The, the advantage that he has by capturing IQ is that at a later time he could go ask the question, were there multiple different ionosons on and can we go look at uh, those different ones? Well, actually, that's not how I read it. I think he's um, storing a very small portion of the data that's coming out of the actual A to Ds in the USRP. Which means that the FPGA code would probably not change very much because that would be kind of a fixed block at the front end. Right. I think he's just I'm doing a, uh, um, a particular form of down converter in the yeah. FPGA. Yeah, it sounds like a, basically a, like a de-chirper uh, right. processing. And, and if you know, we could do something like that and then have a common format, then, then the vast majority of the DSP code or the GNU radio code could operate on those narrow band data sets in a compatible way. Now well, I'm interested then in this one down here that says chirp view. Program for using narrowband ham radio receivers for chirp sounding. Now, one That's... thing I should say, yeah, this, so this is Yuha's website from a few years ago. Um, since he now has left the Sadankaila Geophysical Observatory that's hosting this website, and he's now at the University of Tromsø. So he doesn't up, update this website anymore, but he's continued to do uh, quite a bit of work. And um, so two weeks from this Thursday, we're going to have a special Hamside Telecon at 3 p.m. on July 2nd. I haven't announced this to the, to the list yet, but Yuha will give a presentation on the current status of his work, and he'll be able to answer all of your questions in person that you have about this. That's and he excellent. also said he'd be willing to, to help us uh, with, you know, help us with what we need. He also has a piece of software that he's working on where he, he said you actually don't need a GPS DO in order to, um, uh, to detect, to decode the ionosons. He has, um, he does have a way of, um, uh, of identifying these and, and finding, detecting them without a GPS DO, but it sounded rather computationally intensive. I think um, some of these ideas, um, it seemed, it seems like 
something where you could play some really nice games with having a network of distributed instruments where you have some receivers do the work of detecting the ionosons and some other receivers do the work of actually analyzing the data. Um, but I, I think when you, you see his presentation, uh, I think a lot of these things, I, I think it'll really get a lot of our brains thinking. Nathaniel, uh, maybe uh, please allow me to ask a question. So, like he, you, you were saying that he has uh, some other uh, arrangement in which we don't need GPS, do you? Um, yeah, he does have... So my, question he is, does have my question is, I want to think, learn from the very basic. So why would we need a GPS, GPS do in the first place? And, and how would he have circum, circumvented that need? Dev, pull your mic away from you. We're getting a lot of shirt noise. Okay, sorry. Um, I think, how does he circumvent that need? I think we'd have to ask him that a little bit more. I think we'd have to ask him that. Uh, I don't know the details of his code. What does the GPS DO do for us? It provides us a, um, a remarkably stable signal reference and time stamping. Um, and it gives us the, um, I think the dual uh, frequency one, dual frequency module that we're looking at using also gives us the ability to um, measure TEC. So there's, there are a lot of advantages to having the GPS DO. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it will be more, more interesting to learn like how, how, how he, he gains those adv advantages without using these. Mm -hmm. right. Well, the other thing is um, having ours uh, synchronized both in frequency and time um, mm -hmm. isn't as important for an application like this where you're doing bringing down two channels in the same receiver as long as their frequency locked to one another phase locked. But um, yeah. if we have stations widely separated and we try to do anything of a is akin to interferometry. It's very useful to have these tightly locked. Mm -hmm. I agree. I would like to mention that on his web page, about halfway down, there is a download spot and there's a GNU Radio Yuha uh, TAR that has the code that he says he was using in 2013. He has it on GitHub too. Um, so, and actually, it should. Dev, do you remember his GitHub page? I it's think like I, I do. I do. Give me a second, okay? I'll 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 send that in in chat. Like I have followed him, so I should be very easily finding him. Okay. Give me one second. I'm looking for it. Okay. Actually, I'd probably say. I found it, okay. You found it? Yeah. Do you want to put it in the chat? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Great. There you go. So, this should be the answer to everyone's questions about algorithms because this should be the latest code.
Looks like he's planning on moving away from the near radio. Well, then he would probably welcome the deep chirping in the FPGA. Yeah. The question is how much of the algorithm that he plays with and modifies and experiments with is outside of that first block? Is it mostly outside of the first block? In which case, you know, we, we give him that format of data and then he doesn't really need to mess with it anymore. He just takes it and, and processes it. Yeah, I, I think that's something I'll have to discuss with him about. I will mention though, for those that are time sensitive, we're just over an hour. I've gotten the call for dinner, so I'll see you next week. Thank you. 73 is all. Well, I think this will be, I'm really excited that we'll be able to work with Yuha. I think it's going to really help with this part of the project. In fact, the more I talk with him, the more I'm not sure that we could really make fast progress on ionosond detection and decoding without his help. But um, I think this is going to be very, very useful. Aside from being an exciting project. Yeah. This is super exciting. This is really good. Well, so anyone have anything else? Seems like we're kind of uh, winding down here. It is about time. Yes, we're. Have you been, we're, able, we're have you been able to find those artless radios, Scotty? I found uh, three sets of filters so far. <laughs> so filters. The, 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 you need uh, a radio to go with it. The Alex filters, I found those. <laughs> <laughs> so I will get them out. I will find them. I'll have a lot more time on July 7th after we're yeah. out of the building, if I survive that long. Oh, moving is so tough. Oh, and it's 106 degrees out today, so it's kind of cool. So, yeah. In fact, after the conference, this is over. I've got to go uh, drive over to the storage shed and dump a bunch of stuff off that I loaded up in the truck before I came home. So, mm -hmm. never ending pile of stuff. You ought to hire some of those Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding? They won't work for me for that. They won't do that kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can't get them to, uh, I've got them to volunteer to lift the golf cart batteries that I've been hoarding for the past uh, about eight years. I have uh, three sets of them, of which I don't believe any of them are any good, and there's eight per set, and they weigh about <laughs> 75 pounds each. So I, got, I have 24 batteries at 75 pounds each, and we got to take them in. They're in the building, so I have to take them to the, uh, to, to back for cores. Yeah, so, so you have a fortune in the lid. Well, you know, the guy, uh, we get free batteries. Every two years or three years, we go to the local interstate battery guy, and he says, oh, you're with the Explorer Post Scouts? Here, have a set of batteries. And what he does is he gives me, it, they supply batteries to RVs. And when a set of batteries comes back that is marked as bad, they might find one bad battery in the batch. Well, they have to, to take the whole batch out of service and give them all new batteries. So then they have these batteries that are slightly used that they can't sell. So he gives them to us to use it in our field day expeditions. But of course this year, no field day for big groups. So we don't really need batteries. But over the years, I've never given him any cores back. And he's really wants the cores back because I mean, he gives us the batteries for free, right? I mean, it's like $1,800 worth of batteries he gives us. And so the least I can do is give him the cores back when, when we're done. I mean. Yeah. Realistically, I could take them to the recycler. I could probably get $15, $20 a battery because they're 70 pounds at least each. Yeah. But I'll give them back to him because he helps us out every time we need it. So, but I got to get, you know, 
three thousand pounds worth of batteries over to his place. <laughs> so it's, but we a have a school bus. We have a school bus. Why well, are you kidding? That's a piece of cake for school bus. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the one of the guys in the explorer post says a three quarter ton pickup, so we can we can overload that easy. Well, I guess we're done. So. Oh, I so, think it's been a good time, huh? Yep. All right. Seven, all right I, did seven, watch, one, all. I did watch your ham sai one again, Nathaniel, but my wife yeah. had, a, had a, a job for me at the time it was scheduled. Oh. So, so I watched the recording. Oh, good. That's great. Thank you. So, so say yeah, that's good. Bill, how's your wife doing? My wife is much better, thank you. Um, she had to spend several days in the hospital, and but now the uh, all of the drugs they've been giving her, all kinds of antibiotics and other stuff, uh, are nursing her back to health. So she's almost back to her sprightly, spry self. And uh, yeah, we had some. We had a. We had a bad couple of months. Both our dogs were built by rattlesnakes and almost died. And then my wife got so sick and it, she got tested like four times for COVID and it wasn't that. So it was just this mm -hmm. other bacterial infection mm -hmm. in her lungs and it takes six months to, to cure. But she's on the road to recovery now. So thank goodness for that. Oh, well, good. Yeah. I can't imagine a six month course of antibiotics. That's pretty brutal. Yeah, you take them three times a week, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to give your system some time to recover. But we also got her on a probiotic that keeps the uh, intestinal flora from being destroyed because that'll, that'll, that job by itself will make you deathly ill. So anyway. Oh, well. Glad to hear she's doing better. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very glad she's doing better. So Nathaniel, just shoot me an email whenever you're ready to set up a sked, and we'll see if we can reach out on 20 or 40 or something. You can you can get on 20 and 40 both with the antenna you have, can you? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it'll probably be um, probably be sometime next week, I think. That's just because uh, we've got the renovation. Just yeah, it sounds great. Mm, that would be good. Don't forget to get on for field day on the 27th and 28th. Well, I'm going to operate uh, okay. uh, class one echo from my house. I uh, got the generator and everything. So I'm going to, I'm going to operate on my own. For yeah, we're going to be doing one a battery. I think only we're going to be running hundred Watts because I told the, my, my buddies that we're doing it with that I'm not doing QRP field day anymore. I, I did that when I was younger, and I've had enough masochism for that. I'm not doing that. Yeah, that's QRP. Life is too short for QRP. That's what I say. I did the Stu Perry 160 test with the KX3 once, and I said, never again am I doing that. Because that was... I did it the year before. I did it both years up at W7 GNP's place up in the mountains. So no noises, no everything. S1 noise level. Everything's quiet. One year I did it with the Omni 6. And an Alpha 88 or 89, full boat, 130 foot tower so side loaded. And uh, the next year I did it with the KX3. So, I mean, talk about the extremes of operating. Here you're running 1500 watts output, and both times you're running a good antenna, but you know, the people just can't hear you at five watts. So, yeah. Anyway. That's the thing is that, you know, you might be able to hear them, but they're deaf. Yeah, and the, well, the also places have noise. a lot of interference, and they can't hear us. You know, the yeah. Stu Perry contest is pretty cool because if you work me and I'm running QRP, you get bonus bonus points because you're the one that has to hear me. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. The guy on the other end is the one who has the hardship. Yeah, right. Yeah, I was finding that during the running six meters over the weekend is. I could hear a lot of signals that they couldn't hear me, and I was running 100 watts. So were they running big power? They must have been running big power, but others were just saying that they had a lot of TRM locally. 
Yeah. I know on the 160 test, one year, I just couldn't seem to get into four lanes. Nobody in the south of the Tennessee border would listen to me. Hmm. And, and I'm hmm. going like, well, my antenna must be messed up because it doesn't aim that way or something. Well, I found out over the weekend after, after the contest was over, they had big time thunderstorms in the southeast and they just couldn't hear anything. So. All right. Well, good night, all. Enjoy okay. it. Okay. We'll see you next week, everyone. Good night. 73. Thanks. Yeah. Good night, everybody. 73. I'll, I'll leave it off the recording as soon as. Uh...